Okay. Good. Oops. Mm, come on. Okay. Good. So, good. Um. Yeah, now it works. Thank you. So good afternoon again. Uh, this is the, 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 the last session of a very long day. I hope you enjoyed it all. Uh, this is uh, one of the breakout sessions and it's the, it's the case-based session on endoscopy. And we try, by saying we, I mean Fabio and myself, we try to do it as interactive as possible. Uh, which is sometimes not too easy with the chat function, but we try to cope with that. Uh, I'll start off with uh, with a, a conflict of interest, which is none in this respect, and go on with the first case. So this was a, a male newborn, 40 weeks of GA. There were oligohydramnios in pregnancy, and the baby was born and, and immediately developed respiratory distress with massive strider, it was biphasic strider, so inspiratory and expiratory strider. So that uh, the, the junior neonatologist started back, back mask ventilation and he tried to intubate the child, failed so, called the senior neonatologist and the senior neonatologist also failed to intubate the child. So what would you think of such a case? Apparently, bag mask ventilation worked, so ventilation was okay, the, the oxygenation was okay, but uh, there was this massive inspiratory and expiratory strider, meaning that there must be very severe obstruction. And if you think such an obstruction, where, where should it be in such a case? If it's biphasic strider, it must be somewhere in the central airways, so it must be either in the larynx or the trachea, or both. Um, as the neonatologists failed to intubate the child, uh, they called, at, at that time it, it was me on call, um, called me to do an airway endoscopy to, to sort out what was going on here. And this is just a still picture, because I don't want to show the video I want for the sake of time. And also because it, uh, it's sometimes it was not too clear the picture because it is a 2.2 millimeter bronchoscope with any suction channel. And this still picture here shows you the, the, the larynx. This is the anterior commissure. This is the right vocal cord, uh, sorry, the, the right and the left false cord. And this is the vocal cord lever here. And what you can see here is that you don't see the subglottic area, the subglottic space, but only a very tiny little hole to the very posterior aspect here. And this is the hole through which the child was ventilated. In the first beginning, we, we thought it, it, this is clearly a web. This is an incomplete web. And we, we, we thought about maybe thin web. So I tried to, to uh, probe this uh, um, larynx. And I was successful in doing that with a small biopsy forceps, which is only one millimeter in diameter. So I, the larynx could be probed, and I tried to do an endoscopic intubation via this via the bronchoscope, but I could not pass the 2.2 millimeter bronchoscope through, uh, so this was not possible. So it was not possible to even not possible to do an endoscopic intubation. In such a situation, uh, you should do what? I ask you. What is your options? I don't see anything on the chat now. Is this is, is there anything and I just don't see it or Mark, can can you tell me, Mark, is there any uh I, no okay, okay. I see now I see now rigid bronchoscopy and I see tracheotomy or tracheostomy uh, repeatedly and that's that's exactly what you have to do. You have to, to secure the airway and how can you do that in such a severe case? You do emergency tracheostomy and that's what we did in this very severe or, uh, airway obstruction. It was, if you follow the um, classification that was put forward by Maya and colleagues, uh, 
referred to that already yesterday in my presentation. It was a grade three obstruction, uh, much more than 90% here of airway obstruction. And uh, so we secured the airway by the tracheostomy. The child needed then uh, altogether three operations to get the larynx fixed, larynx reconstructed, because it was not a thin web, but a very thick uh, web, if you call it a web still, it was very close to laryngeal atresia actually, because it started off at the glottic level and then down at least uh, with a height of half a centimeter to the to the subglottic area. So this was uh, a, an almost complete, very thick laryngeal web, very close to laryngeal atresia actually. Next case is again a male. Uh, um, uh, slightly preterm baby, 36 weeks of GA. There was chorionitis and acute respiratory distress syndrome. Um, the child had to be intubated, mechanically ventilated for altogether 11 days, but then could be discharged without any respiratory problems, meaning there were no respiratory, uh, uh, there was no sound, no noise, so no strider, no nothing. Uh, completely normal child. After three months of age, the mother came back with the child. Um, sorry, I, I just look at the chat for a moment. I'm curious if you're with the, or ready to do the tracheostomy. Yes. So, so to answer these questions, uh, we we have a pediatric surgeon uh, close by, and I, I did the bronchoscopy already with the surgeon on my right hand side. Yeah. So to answer this question in the chat. Back to the new case. Um, uh, th at three months of age, uh, the child came back. Uh, the mother came back with the child because there had been acute onset of strider, and at admission, the child was mildly tachypneic, uh, had intercostal and, and um, jugular retractions. And again, this child also had strider, which was a biphasic strider as well. What would be your most likely diagnosis here? What is the differential here? Think about intubation, mechanical ventilation, and at three months of age, uh, strider. So I, I can see here tracheal stenosis, tracheal stenosis again, post-intubation, tracheal narrowing are your suggestions. Yes, you would think of subglottic stenosis. You would at least think of an acquired problem because for a congenital problem, uh, the, the history is, is with a congenital problem, the history is not really compatible. Because if you do have a congenital problem, and uh, if, if the problem is severe enough, you will have the respiratory noise, in this case, the strider already from the very beginning, or you will, you will have that with a triggered by respiratory tract infection, but there was no respiratory tract infection in this case. So we, again, we, we did, obviously, it's an endoscopy workshop, so we, we did an endoscopy here, uh, not meaning that we do only endoscopies, but it, this is clearly the, the method of choice here. And what you can see here again in the still picture is the, is the glottic level. This is the anterior commissure. And you see in the subglottic area or subglottic space, you see two things here, a big one on the right-hand side and the smaller one on the left-hand side. And these are acquired subglottic cysts, clearly uh, stemming from the initial intubation and the ETT being in place for 11 days. So what do you have? If, if you have a problem here, you will get ischemia, pressure necrosis, uh, granulation tissue that uh, will develop on, on these grounds. And uh, if the granulation tissue blocks the, the ducts of submucosal glands, the child will develop these um, cysts. So acquired subcarotic stenosis is the diagnosis here, and it's not just relation tissue, it's also the, it's, it's these cysts. I pointed out yesterday already that if you uh, see cysts in the, in the subcarotic area or even further down, then it's, it's almost always acquired cysts. Congenital cysts you see uh, in the supraglottic area. Next point. Again, a three-month-old male, but previously healthy. So, so no history so far. Um, um, sorry, again, but there's a late incoming question. How do you manage those? So you, you have to remove these cysts. And this is, is, is done maybe by ENT people, or in our case, it's, it's the, the pediatric surgeons. And you, you just remove these cysts 
uh, with various options you have as a surgeon. You they, they may sometimes they use laser, sometimes they they use um, instruments. But uh, these cysts have to be removed completely so that they will there will not be a relapse. Um, a previously healthy three months old male uh, had a runny nose for three days, a little bit of cough, a little bit of temperature, low grade fever only, and noisy breathing, no feeding difficulties. So the child was feeding well. The physical examination showed that the boy was in good clinical condition with normal height and weight, and there was clear secretion from the nose, uh, breathing frequency of 40 per minute, and strider and retraction. So your diagnosis here. What does this look like? Viral group. Yeah, this is this is the exactly what you would uh, expect or suspect in a child with viral group. Uh, if you if you think so as well, but it, what is not typical here? If we say it's too young, the, the baby is too young for group. Perfectly right. So it's a typical croup because the child is only three months of age. So you, you would expect croup from six months onwards. And of course, if the child is five months and a week, you wouldn't probably think it's atypical. But two or three months of age is clearly a typical croup. And this is very, a very clear indication for doing an airway endoscopy. And this is what we did. And I'll show you a video now. You see, we look at the larynx. Just spontaneous breathing. This is the, the vocal cords here. You look, you see the subquotic area here. And what do you see here? What can you detect here? This is the situation before treatment. And this is uh, showing you um, uh, uh, here, here, Malaysia. No, this is not Malaysia. This is already after treatment. So what you should have seen before here on the left-hand side is now much smaller. No worries, I'll show you again. Subchiotic edema. Yes, if you look at this picture, at this, at this part of the video, it looks like a symmetric lesion. And could the subchiotic edema actually could look like that. So if you look at the uh, subchiotic area, and you see a kind of symmetric lesions. It could it's lesion. It could be subchiotic edema. It could also be a congenital subchiotic stenosis. This membranous form I talked about yesterday. But this was clearly only a symmetric, symmetric appearing picture after treatment. But before treatment, uh, it was like this. You see this this mass, this unilateral mass originating here from the left. Um, lateral wall of the subglottic area, so there is no symmetry here. So it's not a congenital subglottic stenosis of the membranous type. And the most likely diagnosis here is what one of you already suggested. It's subglottic hemangioma. And uh, the second part of the video uh, showed you, maybe I can go back for a moment. I think we have the time uh, to the video. Uh, you see now in a minute or in a second rather, you see this subglottic hemangioma here. You see it's, it's going at least to the midline, even a little bit further to the right here. So clearly an asymmetric lesion. And what we did in this child is what is standard treatment nowadays, which is a, a treatment with a beta blocker. And if we look at the video a little, you see this is, this is uh, the control endoscopy after uh, a few weeks of treatment. You see it's much smaller now. Okay, next case, seven-month-old girl, runny nose for one day. The mother was ill as well. The mother had a sore throat, showed, so there was clearly a viral respiratory tract infection going on in the family. The mother was taking medication. The girl also developed fever, hoarseness, and also a strider. What is, what is this? Just the diagnosis with this chemical picture. So viral or tract infection, hoarseness, strider, croup. Yeah, it's definitely croup. The, 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 the age of the child is okay, so months. So what did we do? Obviously, we treated it like you treat a croup. We did systemic corticosteroids uh, uh, with usual doses. Um, I'm emphasizing that so the dosage, the doses were, were good, not 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 too low. Uh, and we did that repeatedly, but there was only marginal improvement. 
So virtually no improvement at all. So when 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 we look at that uh, with no improvement due to periods, not even a temporary improvement, it's again atypical group. The child was not too young, but there was no improvement with treatment, so it's atypical. So we back to the mother and did another history. Then the mother told us that one day before the onset of Strider, the girl was playing with a pack of tablets. It actually was, was the tablets that the mother was taking because of the sore throat. The mother was uh, aware of, 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 of the problem of possible foreign body aspiration with small pieces and, and checked everything very carefully and said there was definitely no tablets missing after the child was playing here. And also there were no signs and symptoms uh, after that hadn't been there before. So was, there was no choking or anything else. But still, it was atypical group. So we did a bronchoscopy because I told you already it's a clear indication for doing bronchoscopy. And look at what we saw. When you looked at the larynx or the subbiotic area here, then you see obvious uh, an obvious thing here. It shouldn't be there. And this is, what do you think this is? I wait for one or more seconds. So this is actually a foreign body here. So you see this, this swollen and, and reddish mucosa because it had a respiratory tract infection, but there's also a foreign body. And, and, and as some as metallic foreign body, yes, it was, the, it was a, a, a piece of, of, this, of this pack of tablets. This was actually the foil that the child had taken into the mouth and then aspirated. And this was the reason why the strider did not go away even with a um, uh, proper dose of systemic corticosteroids. It was quite easy to take this uh, foreign body out, even with the flex of bronchoscope, because you see it's, it's a fall. Uh, and so if you go there with uh, uh, forceps, you can, can easily grasp it and take it away. I don't want to uh, make the impression that we do if we, if we um, suspect foreign body aspiration, we always think we can do it with a flexible bronchoscope because I'll show you this case and there will be another one. Uh, uh, but in, 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 in these kind of uh, exceptional cases, you, you will be able to do it also with a flexible bronchoscope. And in my place, as I said already before, we're working very closely together with the pediatric surgeon. So we're doing very often, we do our procedures together. So and. An aluminum foil, as someone of you pointed out already. Next case, uh, a boy again, one year of age. He was playing again with uh, small pieces with a balloon. And the mother um, was alert because there was one part of the mount of the balloon that was missing after she hadn't observed the child for a little while. The child also was choking and coughing. So this is a very key history for what do you suspect here when you hear that? Uh, nobody writes that, but but I think everybody thinks that it's a key history of foreign body aspiration. The child, unfortunately, was not referred to us primarily, but to a local uh, hospital where there was there's a small pediatric department. And what they did was uh, check the stools because they also suspected in a way a foreign body, but not in the in the respiratory tract, but in the GI tract. And what they did also, which which certainly should not be done in this case, was a GI tract endoscopy where they didn't find anything. The day after, they sent the child to us because the child had also a viral respiratory tract infection, because for some days prior to the event, uh, I just told you, the child already had had a runny nose and cough. Um, when the child then was admitted uh, uh, in my hospital, um, it showed diffuse, on a quotation, it showed diffuse wheezing, a prolonged expiratory phase, no, certainly no difference between the right and the left lung, but also inspiratory strider, especially when the child was agitated. Do you still think of a foreign body aspiration, or is this also with a, with a history that's suggestive for foreign body aspiration, but also a history that clearly shows you that the child has um, a runny nose and also coughing already before that period? Do you think uh, you could be happy with saying it's just a viral respiratory tract infection? There's, there's a question on is was the wheezing monophonic? Uh, and uh, someone says foreign body aspiration should be excluded. X-ray done. Of course, there was an X-ray done. Um, and the, the left X-ray actually, so 
both of the X-rays were done before bronchoscopy. I can tell you that already. But uh, the left X-ray shows something that the right X-ray doesn't show that clearly. Um, are you okay with that when, when you see that there was there was no difference between the right and the left lung in, in terms of auscultation, and there was also no difference between the right and the left lung on the, on the chest X-ray. So if you think there is a foreign body, where should the foreign body then be with uh, this X-ray and with uh, wheezing, which was monophonic wheezing, to answer this question, and also the stride or uh, the child had when the child was agitated, then you would certainly expect that the foreign body would be somewhere in the central airway, so certainly above the crina, maybe in the trachea and or the larynx, uh, certainly in the central airways below the vocal cords to the trachea. I also see right middle bronchus here or larynx, so it's different options here in the chat. Uh, what we did, because we, we looked very carefully uh, at this X-ray, and we also asked the mother what what part of the mount of the balloon is missing. We exactly knew what we should look for, and if there were a foreign body, we knew what foreign body it would be. So we, again, in this exceptional case, so again, this is not the rule, we went for flexible bronchoscopy, and I'll show you the bronchoscopy, and I'll explain later why we did that. And when you go down here, you already see that there is a little bit of, of swelling here and also of, of reddening of reddish mucosa. This is perfectly in line with the, the respiratory tract infection the child had, and maybe also with the stride of the child uh, when agitated. But a little, only a little bit further down, uh, there was the foreign body, as you can clearly see here. And this was a kind of stent-like thing, just too small for a stent. And this was exactly what we were looking for, because the mother told us, told us what, what part was missing. Um, and this actually could be very easily taken out by flexible bronchoscopy. I show you the foreign body here. It was like four centimeters in length. And, and you, you saw it, it was like a stent, so it was easy to go through this foreign body with a forceps and then opening the branches of the forceps once the forceps are through and then just pulling this out with a flexible bronchoscope. Again, flexible bronchoscopy is not what we usually recommend for foreign body extraction, but in, in, this, in exceptional circumstances, we go for that, especially if we see the foreign body, which is here already, you see that there is a, a normal track here, here in the extrathoracic portion. And if you go to the intrathoracic part of the track here, you see that in the midst of the air column, there is this foreign body. And this is exactly what the mother um, had told us because she told us that this part, and I showed you the foreign body we extracted, this part was missing. So we exactly knew what to look for. Next case is an 11 month old girl, um, and the history goes back for three weeks altogether. It was initially rhinitis or coryza, and then the child developed cough and also elevated temperatures up to 39 degrees for three weeks. Not a persistent fever, but just waxing and waning. But there were almost not, not, not a single day where the, where the child didn't have uh, increased uh, temperature. Feeding difficulties mean the child had um, less appetite and um, actually just when, when we saw the child for the first time, there was a runny nose for one day. Body weight at that time uh, was at the third person time and there was mild expiratory wheezes. This is what was written in the charts before uh, I saw the child on the ward. There was an X-ray on and the X-ray showed what you see here. What do you think? What is, what, what is this? How, how, you, how would you describe or do you think about this chest X-ray? What's the pathology here? So right below atelectasis, yes. Is it, the, is, it, is it the whole lobe or is, 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 is it not the whole lobe? So infiltrate of the right upper lobe or atelectasis, it's, it's not so clear. I, I agree with that because there is some air in the periphery. You see there, there are two parts more or less. So this is, a, this is a, a dense part here. Then there is a line here. There's another part here. This is all of that is the right upper lobe. And if you look at the hilum, 
you see it is enlarged. And when we, uh, when we examined the child on, on, on the ward, it, it was true that there were expiratory wheezes, but it was localized expiratory wheezes. So it was not diffuse wheezing mm -hmm. like you could expect. If you go back to the history again, this uh, an 11 months old girl as well with two respiratory tract infections. Yeah, so because rhinitis, cough, temperatures, uh, again, again, rhinitis, uh, less appetite. This could be just two respiratory tract infections. And if you if you read my respiratory wheezes, this would be in line with wheezy bronchitis at this time. And you still have obviously we have to 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 find out what's the reason for for the relative uh, body weight. But because it was expiratory wheezes only localized and again monophonic. And it was just here when you uh, auscultated the chest here. Then this was a clear indication for what? For localized airway obstruction. So not diffuse airway obstruction like in wheezy bronchitis, but the localized problem. So the, the, the noise was here. The um, the, the radiological um, pathology is here. And there is, a, there is a saying that goes back to, to Sutton, which was a famous British bank robber, uh, who allegedly was asked um, why he, 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 he did rob banks, because after he did that for a while, he was caught. Uh, and he said, because that's where the money is. So we, it's very often we say, you have to go where the money is. And if we see such a picture, and we, we, we hear the wheeze is here, we have to go here to see what's going on. Of course, you can think about CT scanning as well, but we prefer to do bronchoscopy here because it not only tells you what the problem is really, because uh, we also thought of the differential already, and, and for some of the differentials, it would be worthwhile to, to get also materials, so to, to get the bronchial wheel or large fluid or maybe a biopsy even. Uh, and this was the reason why we, we, we did the, the bronchoscopy first, because I'm, I'm going to ask why not CT. So we went where the money is. And what we saw, this is just a still picture, is this is the right bronchial uh, tree, uh, if you want to put it like that way. And this is uh, the uh, bronchus intermedius. So, so here should the orifice be of the right upper lobe bronchus. And you see there is no orifice at all, or rather there's only a tiny slit, which you can imagine is here. We squeezed in then with the bronchoscope, so we could pass compression. And just after the curve, uh, we saw that um, there was granulation tissue, and there was also caseous material. We got this material, and it was clearly positive in terms of uh, TB. So this was actually... Um, uh, TB and the bronchial tuberculosis because one of the lymph nodes broke through and caused this um, um, partly part atelectasis of, of the right upper lobe. We treated the child for two months. Um, uh, we treated it longer, but we, uh, after two months of treatment, including uh, systemic corticosteroids, we uh, saw this. And this, this obviously was much to our pleasure because there was complete recovery here. You, you can't even see the lymph nodes anymore and, and, and there was complete re aeration of the right upper lobe. So the cue here was uh, the localized monophonic wheezing uh, in line with the localized problem on the chest X-ray. I just have to, uh, yeah, I'm still in time. So I'm a bit quicker than I was before. Um, now we have um, another case, an 11-year-old girl. And this girl had already pneumonia in the right upper lobe six months before admission. Two weeks prior to the admission, she had again pneumonia in the right upper lobe, was treated again with amoxicillin and clavulanic acid for 14 days, and uh, cough and fever stopped, but there was a chest X-ray done and the consolidation persisted. So there was the, the chest x-ray did not get clear. Physical examination did not show any abnormalities. I'll show you the chest x-ray, which was taken two weeks prior to admission uh, to my unit. Uh, so when the, the treatment was started and then at admission. 
as, and as you can clearly see here, it's in again, again the problem is in the right upper loop. And you can you can see although the child was perfectly well, no fever, no cough, cough, no nothing, uh, the, the chest X-ray did not clear. But what is more important here is that it was the second pneumonia after six months in the same area. So two pneumonias in the right upper lobe. What do you think of that? What would be your next steps? Would you go for bronchoscopy? Would you go for imaging? Would you do both? What would be your differential here? CT scan, I read. Yes, that's what we did. But we did a few other things as well. Um, we the, the, the blood count was normal. C-reactive protein was negative. We uh, checked immunoglobulins. We did a MAN2 test, so, so tuberculosis negative. So that test was normal, and also pulmonary function tests were completely normal. Some of you uh, think of a congenital anomaly. I'll go back once more to the to the chest X-ray. Again, you have a localized problem apparently because if you have right upper lobe pneumonia once and six months after you have it again, then you will have to suspect a localized airway problem. Again, if it's right upper lobe, like before, you would suspect to have the problem in the right upper lobe bronchus, very close to the origin, because, because if the right upper lobe bronchus and not just the segment is involved, you would expect, you would expect, a, you would expect a problem there. And that could, Fabio? Yes? Do you want to say something? No, 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 sorry. No, no, okay, sorry. Um, so, uh, you could think of congenital anomaly, absolutely. Tracheal bronchus, I also read here. So, if there's a tracheal bronchus that has been so far undetected, and the tracheal bronchus, as I told you yesterday, is there is stenosis or malacia, this could be, be, clearly be a reason for uh, recurrent pneumonia in the same area. So, this is a very good idea. Other congenital anomalies could also be. So it, not necessarily the tracheal bronchus. If there is a stenosis or, or a malacia of the right upper lobe bronchus, even if it's not a tracheal bronchus, could cause that problem. But you would probably expect uh, complications like pneumonia a little bit earlier than at 11 years of age. What else could that be? It could be a chronic foreign body, but uh, you wouldn't expect a chronic foreign body uh, in the right upper lobe bronchus in an 11-year-old girl. When you look more closely to the hilum here again, there is not only this consolidation here, but there is again this round or oval mass-like thing. So what we did, and, and again, you, you could think like, like some of you do, you could think of TB like before, but it would be boring to show you two cases of TB, and, and also tuberculin skin testing was negative, as, as I told you. Um, and what we did was a CT actually, and then also a bronchoscopy. And this is the CT, and I'll show you four slices here. This is uh, the track here, here, as you can see. This is the level of the bifurcation or main carina. This is already the right and the left main stem bronchus. And this is the origin of the right upper lobe bronchus here, stemming from the right uh, main bronchus. And you can see there is a mass that was already uh, or what was almost um, two centimeters uh, times one point something centimeters, and you can see the mass also here. And, and actually, we were able to see the mass also already in this area. So we did go for bronchoscopy, and again, it's only a still picture uh, because we did not do a biopsy. I have to tell you, uh, but it was a, a, a mess because when just touching this lesion with the bronchoscope. Um, inadvertently, uh, it started bleeding, and you again see this should be the right upper lobe bronchus here, and you see this mass here. This should be the right intermediate bronchus. You see it's 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 going further down along the wall, like infiltrating this wall. Uh, and actually, this was a tumor, as you can see, and it was a carcinoid. Uh, and also, it's it's the very typical appearance of of a, of a carcinoid. So I think. Um, I'll hand over to Fabio now because I'm done anyway and I'm, I think I was also on time. So, Fabio, okay. would you like to continue? Perfect. And I'll give control to Fabio. Okay, so I want to skip this case. I 
cannot control the No. Okay, you should have control now. Okay, so I will skip this case and uh, uh, I will pass directly to uh, this one. So uh, this is a child that has stridor and aphonia. If you uh, remember, uh, yesterday when I gave my presentation uh, uh, on bronchoscopy, sometimes it's difficult to decide if to perform bronchoscopy in a child with stridor. But uh, what I, I say that usually when you have two symptoms, stridor plus aphonia, stridor plus uh, cough during feeding, you should always go and see to exclude the presence of something different than the laryngomalacia. And this is the case of a child with stridor and aphonia. And this is the reason why we perform bronchoscopy in this child. And uh, you see that the larynx is completely normal, the IDP glottis falls, and uh, in between the vocal cords, what did you see? Which is your uh, opinion, which is your diagnosis. So you see, you cannot see, these are the false vocal cords. In this child, you cannot see the vocal cords because this child has a web under the vocal cords. So a child with stridor, plus uh, aphonia. It's correct, is a child with a laryngeal web. Again, there is a child with persistent atelectasis in a patient with TB. What is your opinion of this chest X-ray? Is it normal or what do you see in this chest X-ray? You see, what is uh, possible to see is a clear, localized, higher trapping. And when you have a child with localized higher trapping, which is your clinical suspicious? Child that comes to your attention in the emergency room with a severe uh, onset of respiratory distress. So this is a typical radiological finding of a foreign body, correct. But in this case, it's not a foreign body because we know that this child as a TB, was under TB treatment. And on the lateral view, you can see that this child has a big mediastinal lymph nodes. So uh, could be a compression of the lymph nodes on the main right bronchus. But what else? Which is a, a clinical picture of primary TB in children. And we decide to do the uh, video. And I think that this video is very uh, interesting because uh, you will see this is the trachea and you see the main carina. And uh, uh, usually the main carina is, uh, uh, is very sharp. In this case, the, the, is, uh, that the main carina is wide. And this is a typical finding when you have a lymph node that are pushing from outside. So external compression from outside. And you see also on the uh, right main bronchus that is closed because there is some exus uh, material. So this is a complication of primary TB in children. So a child, here it is, you see, a child with a fistula between the mediastinal lymph nodes and the main right bronchus. The typical finding complication of primary TB. So the middle right uh, lobus uh, syndrome. This is a case of a child with the recurrent pneumonia of the right lower lobe. This is a chest X-ray of this child showing the consolidation. Uh, this is a child that has been always in good condition. We usually say that if you have pneumonia, you are everybody can have one pneumonia in their life. If you have two pneumonia, you are unlucky. If you have three pneumonias exactly in the same place, you should always go and see if there is something. So the indication to perform bronchoscopy in this child is the presence of recurrent pneumonia three times, always in the same place. Here you see the, uh, the, the picture of this child. You can see the carina that is uh, much, that is really very sharp. And if you compare this carina with the other one, you see, you can see the difference. And here is the video. We are already in the uh, right uh, main bronchus. 
and you see that in the right male bronchus, there is a mass that is also occluding all the lumen of the main right bronchus, which is your diagnosis. What would you do in this child? Would you do a biopsy to see the histology? Yes, we, in this case, we did the biopsy and we make the diagnosis of adenoma of the right main bronchus. We know that bronchial 65% uh, of uh, tumors, lung tumors, lung tumors are malignant, and bronchial adenoma are the most common, in particular carcinoid. Carcinoid is the most common pediatric uh, bronchial uh, adenoma tumor in children. Again, <coughs> if you remember, uh, this is a child with stridor, it's a child that has a severe stridor, the child was not growing well. He had an episode of low oxygen saturation. So this is the indication uh, to do to perform bronchoscopy. And if you remember, when I gave the presentation on bronchoscopy, I uh, recommended to do bronchoscopy. Uh, when you do you perform bronchoscopy, you always preserve the dynamics of the airways. And uh, uh, probably you have Ernest that uh, stridor is visible. So what does it mean? That when you have stridor, you should always find the reason why uh, why is uh, uh, why the child is breathing uh, normally by itself. And uh, uh, so we perform bronchoscopy, and you see that anatomy. This under general anesthesia, you see that under anatomy the the structure of the larynx is completely normal. Here we are in, uh, in the main uh, carena, in, the, in the, this is the main carena, we are in the trachea. This is the uh, main left bronchus. Uh, you can see the lower lobe and the upper lobe and the lingula, and this is all normal. Usually we perform, uh, we start to perform bronchoscopy and general anesthesia, but we always remain and wait until the, the child is awake to see if he is something else, and in this case, you see that when the child is uh, relieved from general anesthesia, this child had a, a typical uh, malaysia of the pharyngeal muscles. And the reason why, you can see this here, child has stridor was not because of malaysia of the larynx, but because of malaysia of the pharyngeal wall. So this is a typical example showing the importance to perform a, a bronchoscopy uh, with preserving uh, the dynamics of the airways. And uh, uh, it's very important to see the dynamics of the upper airways uh, before you perform general anesthesia or after you finish to perform bronchoscopy. So a case of stridor secondary to uh, pharyngeal, uh, malaysia of the pharyngeal muscles. And uh, here again, uh, a child of six months, with we know this child since many uh, many months because it was always coming to us, often coming to our attention with wheezy bronchitis, and uh, he started the treatment for TB uh, because the mother was positive for TB, and uh, this is the chest X-ray of the of when the child came to our attention with another episode of wheezing. You remember that uh, wheezing. Persistent recurrent wheezing is an indication to perform bronchoscopy, but it's very important to recognize the kind of wheezing because if you have a polyphonic bilateral wheezing, you, you think about asthma, but when you have a, a monophonic persistent wheezing, you should always think about a congenital malformation or a foreign body inhalation. So this is a child, six months, with an episode of wheezing, normal chest X-ray, but uh, with monophonic wheezing. So there is the indication to perform bronchoscopy. And this is the video of this child. We are in the trachea, and you see that uh, in a moment that uh, the trachea is almost completely occluded by the presence, also in this case, of caseosus material. So this is a rare case of a fistula between mediastin and infonod, and, and trachea in a child that was under treatment for TB. 
And we were very lucky because we uh, were able to make the diagnosis just in time. We took off the caseosis material and we closed the fistula with the glue. So this is a case of complication of primary TB with a fistula between mediastinal lymphonode and the trachea. You see, it's very clear. You can see here the uh, caseosis uh, uh, material. Now, two years and six months, four days of cough and fever. This child, uh, uh, so just answer to a couple of questions. Uh, bleeding is one of the side effects of a biopsy of the mass. If you have a carcinoid, you should always avoid the biopsy because they can bleed very easily. Uh, so uh, you should, uh, in this case, uh, we decide to do the, the biopsy because uh, we don't think about uh, uh, because, uh, because uh, we were thinking that that was not a, 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 a carcinoid. The material was uh, a remove uh, laser treatment and uh, aspiration, and uh, there is a specific glue that you use for uh, the, the closure of uh, esophageal or uh, bronchial uh, um, fistula. So let's go back to our case. Four days, cough, fever. Uh, the clinical uh, uh, finding on physical examination of uh, lung pneumonia. Why blood cell count were normal, high C-reactive protein, which is your, uh, would you perform a stress X-ray on this, uh, 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 of this case? This is the stress X-ray. Uh, which is your diagnosis. Uh, diagnosis is uh, a consolidation of pneumonia of the right uh, uh, of the right middle lobe, which is the treatment that you recommended for this uh, uh, child. IV antibiotic, oral antibiotic, which kind of antibiotic would you recommend with this child? Amoxicillin, that is the right uh, uh, answer. So we did, uh, we gave to this child amoxicillin. You, you know the dosage that we should use. Uh, in the meantime, that you, somebody answer, yes, we remove the caso with the rigid bronchoscope. No, we use uh, 90 milligram per kilogram of body uh, weight, uh, not IV, but by mouth. And uh, would you uh, hospitalize this child or would you send this child at home? He was in good condition. Uh, the oxygen saturation was good. We decide the, for, from the guidelines, from what we heard this morning, the right uh, treatment was to send it at home, but our doctor decided to keep the, doc the patient on the, in, the, in the hospital and that was a good choice. And you will see later on why, because after two days of an early treatment, the, ch the child still has fever. So at this point, there is the indication to perform a chest X-ray. And you can, you can see here that after two days of antibiotic, of antibiotic treatment, there was a persistent consolidation of the right middle lobe. And uh, the consolidation was even more evident than the uh, chest X-ray what was performed two days before. So a child with fever, with persistent consolidation, the right middle lobe. So we decide to perform bronchoscopy, which is your clinic suspicious of this case. And uh, uh, these are the picture that you should uh, see. And this is the video. You see, we are in the arena. Uh, you can recognize that the child is not too old because you don't cannot see very well the cartilage ring. We are on the right side, the right bronchus. There is secretion that you aspirate with the a tip of the bronchoscope, and you see that there is a, a, a granulation tissue. Granulation tissue is a, a typical finding when you have a vegetable foreign body inhalation. And if you see uh, carefully, you will recognize that in the middle of the granulation tissue, there is a yellow material and is a foreign body. This is a child that has been leaves. Uh, it was, she, this child was left uh, under a tree by the hands and uh, it was playing with the leaves and it aspirated the leaves. So for a body uh, inhalation, we make the diagnosis with flexible bronchoscope and we extract the foreign body with a rigid uh, bronchoscope. 
You heard yesterday that most of the foreign body should be, taken, should be removed with a rigid bronchoscopy. You can try the, with the flex in some specific condition, but you should always have somebody in the room that is able to do rigid bronchoscopy. Another child, this is an infant that was intubated during the neonatal period with persistent stridor that uh, started after our infection. If you remember, uh, yesterday uh, I say that when you have a congenital malformation, uh, severe, usually you have the symptom just after birth. If the malformation is not too severe, usually you can have the start of chronic symptom just after a viral infection. So here we have a child that was intubated during the neonatal period that had persisted after a viral infection, which is, which is your suspicious, which is your clinical suspicious in a child that was intubated during the neonatal period. So what are you expecting from the, the uh, flexible bronchoscopy? Stenosis, it could be, but stenosis is something that uh, should come uh, right away because uh, you intubate the child, you extubate the child, and you have a stenosis because uh, of, uh, a, uh, of the tube and the tracheal tube. There is something that is typically and is typically secondary to uh, intubation during the uh, neonatal uh, period. Correct, cyst. This was a child with a, a you see that this, the, the, the larynx is completely normal. This is a, a child with saccular cyst under the vocal cord, secondary to uh, intubation during the neonatal period. So you should always think about saccular cyst when you have a child that was intubated and uh, uh, after some period after the, uh, the intubation. You see, you can recognize that this was a, a cyst because it's an asymmetric uh, uh, mass, which, was, which could be your uh, differential diagnosis in this case. What, is, what you can have similar to that, but usually it's more red, uh, uh, yes, uh, hemangioma, correct. So the differential diagnosis would be with hemangioma. Which kind of examination would you do in the case that you suspect hemangioma? MRI, correct, MRI. Another case, four years of age, adopted child, he was uh, in very good condition, no clinical symptoms, no respiratory symptoms. The only things that was reported by the mother, chronic constipation. This child performed an X-ray before a minor operation and the physical examination was negative. This is the chest X-ray of this child. And you see that this child has a consolidation of the lower left lobe and of the lingula. And for this consolidation in a child without respiratory symptoms, in the local hospital where this child was seen, they perform a CT scan. CT scan that confirmed the presence of a consolidation of the lower left lobe of the lingula and of the right middle lobe. So we have a child with no symptoms, with a consolidation in both lungs, and uh, no, a family history completely normal because this was a ch adopted child. But at this point, we went back to the mother and tried to do a better uh, history about this child. And what came out from the mother that this child was uh, uh, taking since three years three spoon of Vaseline oil because of chronic constipation. And each time the child was taking the Vaseline oil, he was coughing and choking. So this is the uh, differential, uh, the BL of this child. This is the differential cell count. You see that this child has a, a lymphocytic alveolitis. This is a macrophage with a nuclei that is pushed to a side of the cells. And this has big empty vacuoli. So when we suspect basin oil, uh, aspiration. We ask to the pathologist to perform a specific staining for fat, and you see that these vacuoli were full of fat. So this is a case of a child that had lipoid pneumonia, correct, because of aspiration 
or Vaseline uh, oil. And this is an example to perform bronchoscopy for bronchial lavage. So the reason why we perform bronchoscopy in this child is mainly to do the lavage. And this child performed a CT scan for years later that show a persistence of the consolidation on the left lower lobe. And this is an irreversible finding because uh, the damage of oil is irreversible. Another uh, case, uh, six years, female. We don't know too much about the history of this child because this child was born in Albania and the mother didn't speak fluent Italian and uh, uh, it was very difficult to keep the story. What we uh, understood that the child received mechanical ventilation for a month, uh, that he had mechanical respiration, uh, left premotor. Uh, we uh, realized from the history that this uh, child uh, has a history of uh, many lung pneumonia of the left, many pneumonia of the left lung, and she was hospitalized in our hospital because of the lung, lung, uh, left lung pneumonia. So this is the, the chest ray of this child, where you can see that this child has a consolidation of uh, the uh, left lower lobe. I don't know if you can see from this uh, chest X-ray, but this child also has several uh, bronchitis uh, uh, findings. So uh, we decided to perform immunology and skin was negative, TB skin test was negative, sweat test was negative, cilia ultrastructure that was negative. So at this point, with examination, would you, would you recommend that in this patient? We decide to perform a CT scan, correct. This is the CT scan of this child that confirmed the presence of a consolidation of the left lower lobe with saccular bronchiectasis. So the confirmation of what we were expecting from the history and from the chest X-ray. We miss something in this patient. This is uh, uh, the uh, anteroposterior image of this uh, child on, uh, on the CT. And uh, what did you see in this, uh, in this patient? You see, this is a stenosis of the main left bronchus, and we didn't realize this on the chest X-ray, so we decided to perform bronchoscopy, and here is what you see. We are already on the main left bronchus, and you can see there is a congenital stenosis of the left main bronchus, and we couldn't pass with the instruments of three millimeters of diameter. And here is the video, uh, after surgery, we send this child to our center in Florence when they do the laser opening of the stenosis and we put a stent, a silicone stent on this child. The problem of this child is that we discuss about the possibility to do resection in the lower lobe because of infection, but we decide to follow this child medically with a chronic, uh, with a chronic antibiotic administration, and here is the silicone stent of the child. That the silicone stent was removed after six months, and the child is doing much better during the clinical follow-up. So, a case of a child with a recurrent infection of the lo left lower lobe, secondary to a congenital stenosis of the main uh, left bronchus. And here, the child is a very interesting case. It's the last case I'm presenting to you today. It's a three years old male child after birth, has a severe respiratory distress. Again, the history was very difficult to take. Others say that the child had a pseudomonas aeruginosa infection, and this for this reason, he was received mechanical ventilation. And the mother also reports the presence of an occasional wheeze, but she was not very clear on the description of the sound. So we, the history was not helpful on this child. What we knew, we knew from the mother, that this child was treated for asthma until the age of six years. He was always in good condition. He plays basketball and he plays flutes. At the age of 12 years, he performed a visit for sport eligibility. And this one, on the top is the lung function test of this. You should be now very uh, good in the, in the trepidation of 
uh, lung function test is a normal lung function test in your opinion, this child has an obstruction only of the expiratory phase or it has obstruction also of the inspiratory phase. It's not, a, it's not a vocal cord dysfunction because this child has an obstruction also of the expiratory phase. It's not a tracheal stenosis because this child has an obstruction also of the inspiratory phase. But this time, the sport doctor say there is, is the child is not cooperating well and they give the possibility the, the certification for competitive sport. After a couple of years, the child came to our attention because of, of a minor cardiac problem and the cardiologist asked for an exercise test. And this is the flow volume curve that was performed in our hospital that is exactly the same of the flow volume curve that was performed two years before when the child was looking for the certificate for a competitive sport. So at this time, we decide to perform bronchoscopy, which is the, which are the patient, fixed obstruction at inspiratory and expiratory uh, part of the curve. So we perform bronchoscopy, nobody and is, uh, is giving the right uh, answer, is a fixed extra-thoracic and intra-thoracic uh, divertigo. It's not vocal cord dysfunction because in that case, uh, you would have a, a reduction only of the inspiratory part of the full volume curve. Subglottic stenosis could be, could be a diagnosis. Uh, compression could be a diagnosis, but... Uh, the, the, the findings is uh, a physical examination of this child was completely normal. Uh, the only thing is that we had a mild increase in respiratory rate and the auscultation of the lungs at rest was normal. And after speaking, he had a mild inspiratory triage and a mild monophonic whiz. And here is uh, the bronchoscope examination. You see these are the normal, the vocal cords, and you see that this child has a web just under the vocal cords. And this child lived for 12 years with this malformation. And it was treated for many years for asthma. The first bronchoscopic examination were considered normal. What we suppose is that this child has a congenital web that it was open during mechanical ventilation when the child was a uh, intubate after birth, and uh, after the extubation, uh, the uh, web came back again. But what is incredible that this child lived with this malformation for almost 12 years, and this is the uh, lung, uh, this is the, uh, we do laser treatment of this child. You see here is uh, the bronchoscope, a, a picture of the bronchoscope examination with the, uh, without the web, and this is the lung function test of this child after surgery. So I don't know if you have a, uh, any question. We are two minutes over uh, the time. So I think that we can uh, close our session. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, at some point, uh, I, I don't know if you can see the other uh, workshop. Uh, you should uh, ask uh, to uh, ER support uh, what they said. Okay, so uh, just uh, on behalf of ERS, first of all, we would like to give a big thanks to Ernst and Fabio. A really big thanks and also to all the participants of the session and of the whole day. And uh, you can already see in the chat box that we kindly ask uh, you, all participants, for your feedback of today's session. Not only this one, but all of all the sessions you attended today. And uh, also we hope to see you tomorrow for the last day of the virtual school. Thank you so much. Okay, so thank you. Thank you. Ciao, Ernest. Uh, but Fabio, I think we should yes, stay here. Exactly. For, and for, for Fabio for, and Ernst, yeah. we can ask you to stay. What do you want? But thank you, thank you very much to the participants for the, for the very, very good interaction. Thank you. This yes, is really yes. Fun. thank you very much. Thank you very much to everybody. And thank you to stay until the end because it's really a long day for us and for the attendees. Okay.
Goodbye. Ciao, Ernest. Uh, you you? So, yes. can, you can you just stay for a minute? I just want to ask for tomorrow something. Yes, of course. Just a moment. Okay, I just I just wanted for tomorrow. Yes. The afternoon. For the Q and A question, you have received the slides, no? Yes. Uh, yes. Can you send them uh, again? You mean? Uh, because uh, when did you send to me? Because to check if I. I, I think Susanna sent them to you. Just yeah, about like like three weeks ago or so. Yeah. Should I send them again, both of you? Now let me see.